Your Coca-Cola bottler presents Claudia. Claudia, based on the play and novels by Rose Franken. Brought to you, transcribed, Monday through Friday, by your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. Relax, and while you're listening, refresh yourself. Have a Coke. And now, Claudia. Isn't it nice and late, David? You can't hear anything but our footsteps. It was a very long movie, wasn't it? It was not only long, but it seemed longer. I'm glad we went. There wasn't even one Mickey Mouse. I don't know what you found to be so happy about. Nice walking home like this. You really want to walk all the way? I wouldn't dream of doing anything else. It's just wonderful to be alone. So late, it feels as if we were the only people awake in all of New York. It isn't as late as all that. It's hardly quarter to one. Maybe people in New York go to bed earlier than other people think they do. Maybe. Not everybody's in bed, though. There's the subway. Maybe it's empty. Somebody has to drive it, you know. There's always a motorman. Maybe there isn't. Maybe it's going all by itself. Maybe it just got tired of sitting wherever subway trains sit when they're not going any place. <laughs> Decided to take itself out for a ride. Well, maybe, but I, I doubt it. You sound kind of tired. In fact, you sound as though you were half asleep. Sure you aren't. Me? Sleepy? I feel wonderful. So glad we're walking. That's good. That goes the only cab I've seen since we left the theater. I wouldn't ride in a cab for anything. I just want to be alone with you. Not even a cab driver around. Well, I thought you liked cab drivers. Not tonight. David, do you have any idea how I feel? Oh, sure, sure. Sleepy. I feel as though we were the only two real people left in New York. A moment ago, we were the only two people awake. Now we're the only two people real. I hope nobody heard you say that. They might resent it. Oh, darling, you know what I mean. I feel as though we've been... Left the whole city. By a rich aunt, I suppose. Or a fairy godmother. <laughs> and in the morning, if we wanted, we can bring everybody back to life again. Right now, we're keeping it very private. Just for the two of us. New York couldn't belong to a nicer girl. She couldn't belong to a nicer man. And one of the nicest things about you is that I'm never sure when you sound sleepy. David, that's the sweetest thing you ever said to me. Oh, listen to the cats. Way off down the street somewhere, the trash men are collecting the trash. There's a locomotive. That's not a locomotive. That's a tugboat. Sounds like a locomotive. Indeed it does. If only there were some steam locomotives in New York, that might very well be one of them. Aren't there any? No. Well, why didn't I ever know anything like that before I got married? Well, I hope because you were never out as late as this before. Or maybe the gentlemen you knew were too busy talking about your... Lovely eyes. You like them? Oh, they're fine. <laughs> well, it would be a big help if you could see in the dark. You don't have to see. You can just listen. You can certainly hear better in the dark. Listen to that fire siren. It's miles away, probably, but the city's so quiet, you can hear it clearly. I like sirens, don't you? They're very exciting. Just the thing for the living room. We ought to throw off the hurdy-gurdy and get a new siren. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose the next modern composers will be writing... Concertos for the siren. David, it's much closer. Maybe they're coming this way. I hear more than one siren now, too, don't you? It must be a big siren. Well, they always sound big at night. It's sort of a chilly sound, isn't it? Oh, I don't think so. It's a little like hearing somebody walk down the street whistling when you're in bed. Well, maybe that's so when they're far away, but it's not a nice sound when it's coming your way. And these party are coming our way. Look at those lights. You hear the motors. They're turning the next corner. David, look at that red glow over those buildings. The fire's right around the corner. What are we waiting Can for? Can we go watch it? Come on, darling, come on. Lady, unless you got boats in the badge, you can't pass here. Claudia, that's the fire line. Won't they let us get any closer? Lady, you don't want to get any closer. 
You see that wall? You don't want that falling down on your pretty little head now, do you? Oh, we can't do any good here. Oh, so it's good you're wanting to do. Well, lady, the police department and the fire department have this condition well in hand. Thank you for your kind offer of cooperation, however. The commissioner and I are very grateful indeed. There's nothing to do but watch. Some fire, isn't it? So high. And flames, you can actually see the flames. It's a real condition, all right. It's a clear three-alarm condition. You mean a three-alarm fire? Certainly. See that red car there? Mm-hmm. That's the battalion chief. He comes along with the first alarm and sees what kind of a condition you got. Uh, fire. 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 Say, there's a lot to a condition besides just a fire. There's the type of construction and the smoke and combustible. Look, it can go right into the building where all the fire is. Oh, David, aren't they brave? If I came along and saw something like that, I'd, I'd just want to turn right around and go back to the firehouse. And play checkers. <laughs> They're a bunch of lazy bums, those firemen. I think that's a terrible thing to say. Look at them. Hey, isn't that somebody climbing over the roof? He hasn't got the brains he was born with. Besides, it looks a lot harder than it is. I think it's just as hard as it looks. Not for them, fellas. They got rocks in their heads. Just a bunch of dumb idiots. <laughs> but you sound like an Irishman yourself, officer. But Foreman Timothy J. Kilbride of County Cork. County Cork? Isn't that in Connecticut? Oh, no, we live in Nutmeg County. <laughs> County Cork's right in the heart of old Ireland. Not that I give you two cents for the whole of it, lady. <laughs> Don't get me wrong now. I can talk about them firemen because my dad was a fireman. Uh, here in New York? Oh, engine company number 12. Say, he was a famous fellow in the old days, and he still is if you listen to him. Lieutenant Smokey McBride. There was never a condition that could lay him out. That's what he says. Condition? What's the mean? He means a... Well, he means a condition. David, it's going to spread to the building next to it, isn't it? Well, naturally. Those fellas like it to spread. It makes more of a show, don't you know? Give people something to look at. How are they going to get people out? Nobody in those buildings. Just a couple of deserted old warehouses. Why, they'd ought to let the whole thing burn down just to get them out of the way. But not those firefighters. Oh, no. Not when they got a good crowd like this one. Where did everybody come from? Just ten minutes ago, we were walking home, and we thought we were the only people left in the city. Uh, everybody loves a fire. Everybody loves to watch people in trouble, mister. That's the whole secret of the human race. Is that it? And when you got thousands of people filling the street and yelling for action, that's when along comes the fire department to put on a performance. No crowd, no firemen. If you've got a crowd, all of a sudden, it takes a hundred firemen to take care of a condition you could handle with as much water as you could get in the Mrs. Thimble. Well, that's a fine way for the son of a fireman to talk. Son of a fireman. Say, I got two brothers who are firemen, too. You ought to hear the way we talk to each other when we get home. I'm the only cop in the family. Maybe that's what made you so bitter. Bitter? Me? <laughs> Say, you ought to listen to them. The whole story is my brothers is lazy. To be a cop, you got to be two inches taller than to be a fireman. And my brothers was too lazy to stretch. <laughs> they lost out by half an inch. You were stretched? I sure was. You'd never know what to look at me, would you? They stretched me an inch and a half, so I made it. Danny and Pat was too lazy to stretch. So what happened? What happened? Danny and Pat, the lazy bum, they get all the glory. Everybody stands around, owing and eyeing. They climb back and forth like a couple of monkeys, and everybody cheers and says they're heroes. And when they walk down the street, they're everybody's pal. Look at those flames, David. You can feel how warm they are on your face. I think they're getting part of it under control. You remember a few minutes back, there were flames coming out of the pipe right back over there. Now all you can see is smoke. Well, they'd have had it under control five minutes ago if they'd wanted to. But that's firemen for you. And all the policeman's good for is telling people to get out of the way. Well, it's a nice world, ain't it? Well, don't the policemen keep the firemen from walking off with the family silver? No, none of that talk, young fella. I'll run you in. <laughs> and Officer Kilbride would keep people from running off with the furniture after his brothers had carried it down to the street. Nobody'd run off with the furniture, David. Oh, they wouldn't, wouldn't they? Lady, you don't know what people are like. In the first place, these conditions wouldn't start without people. Well, how about spontaneous combustion? I never heard of it. I heard of people sleeping in bed with a lighted cigarette in their mouth, dropping a match in a waste paper basket, leaving the stove on. What uh, did you uh, say? I said, leaving the stove on starts fires. Leaving the stove on. 
David, I don't remember turning it off. Oh, don't be silly. You you turned it off all right. David, I'm not sure. And I'm sure that if I remembered, I'd be sure. How's that? You don't look like the kind of lady who goes out and leaves the stove on. Or do you? I can't really see so good in this light. I, I, I know. I turned it off under the soup and the string beans, the coffee. I know I left it burning. I guess they haven't got it under control. Here comes more engines. They ain't coming here. You're sure of that? Sure. I can tell by the sound. And this fire's under control. Now they're going somewhere else in the neighborhood, though. There's another condition around here somewhere. Another one around here? The stove, David. We'd better go home. Now, but Claudia, there's no... But lady! David, let's hurry. Come on, now. Come on. Hurry up, David. I'm sure it's the stove. There. There it is. Our house. Doesn't look as though there was a fire here after all. Well, I guess you did remember to turn off the stove, Mrs. Norton. Yes, I did. <laughs> it's all right, darling. Most of the people in the world are the same way. Whenever they hear a fire engine, one part of them thinks it, it must be going to my own house. Me too. It's awfully quiet. Mm-hmm. We're the only people left in the city again. <laughs> New York belongs to us. Oh, no, we're not the only people. I know Officer Kilbride is somewhere around. <laughs> David, will we have to have a fire of our own to find him again? Well, I hope not. Why? Well, when he started talking about stoves, I forgot to ask him the most important question of all. What was that? David, how am I ever going to find out? Find out what? How he was stretched. These broadcasts are adapted for radio by Manya and Roger Starr. Oh, and... hey there, lad. Just a moment, please. Uh, yes, Officer Kilbride? Say, is the lass ever going to know how I was stretched? <laughs> well, you never know what Claudia's going to know. Well... I hope she'll never be known what it is to have a fire of her own. Well, fire's one thing you can't be too careful about, isn't it? And it's a good thing to keep yourself protected as well, particularly when you have your own home. Well, uh, Officer Kilbride, could you be suggesting that Claudia and David protect their new house with some fire insurance? I leave it to Mr. Norton. That young man knows what he's doing. And he'll have to know what he's doing tomorrow, because that's when David will try to sell Claudia on buying some fire insurance. <laughs> that's a job for a man, all right. <laughs> I sure would like to be there to hear that. <laughs> well, goodbye, lad. And I'll bet David wishes you'd be there tomorrow, too, when he introduces Claudia to fire insurance. Goodbye, Officer Kilbride. The entire production of this broadcast was supervised and directed by William Brown Maloney. <laughs> Your teenager's notion of a good time may not always jive with yours. But one delight of teenagers is quite understandable, and that's Coca-Cola. Give youngsters plenty of ice-cold Coke and funds in the air, which is only natural. For Coke is what any of us orders when we want to enjoy the pause that refreshes. Every day, Monday through Friday, Claudia comes to you, transcribed, with the best wishes of your friendly neighbor who bottles Coca-Cola. So listen again tomorrow at the same time. And now this is Joe King saying au revoir. And remember, whoever you are, whatever you do, wherever you may be, when you think of refreshment, think of Coca-Cola. For ice-cold Coca-Cola makes any pause the pause that refreshes. <laughs>